So Brooke is the, the founder of a company called Founders Factory, um, which is um, sounds really um, metal stamping like, um, which in the you know, startup space, you know, is you know kind of you know weird, uh, maybe. Uh, so give us a sense of your background. Uh, you know, you've been an entrepreneur. You've had, you, you know, you've had some some successful companies you know, before Founders Factory. Uh, so give us a sense of, of where you were before Founders Factory, and then ultimately how you decided to uh, pursue Founders Factory and put get that up, get that off the ground. Okay. Uh, so I've been in Columbus now for about seven years, seven coming up on seven years. Uh, first moved here after selling my company out in Chicago to a uh, private equity group out in Silicon Valley, and after finishing my earnout on that and uh, transitioning to a new CEO. Decided to do uh, startup stuff in Columbus, Ohio. Moved the family here. I'm an OSU undergrad graduate, where I met my wife, um, which is why I'm in Ohio, not, not OSU, my wife. Uh, and uh, started several startups, kind of like what you've been there today. And uh, one of them got some traction. Uh, we raised a little bit of capital. Uh, took that to an exit, a company called Mobile Money. And after that, I got a bit of a passion for doing what I can do to improve the startup ecosystem here in town. And we were really focused in on uh, three areas. So we founded this back in 2010, uh, Founders Factory. And I managed to convince uh, several other like-minded entrepreneurs that we needed to provide early stage capital. Uh, we needed to provide mentorship and advisory services from people that have been there and done that. And we need to provide assistance with product and technology, and that's what we put together at Founders Factory. Uh, so since then, we've been heavily involved in the community. We've uh, supported the 10 Accelerator program in the last couple of programs we've actually ran. Um, we have uh, a portfolio of 38 companies that we've invested in over the last few years. Um, some of those have gone on to later stage investment. So we've deployed about 1.2 million. We've seen 12 million in follow-on investment. So it's good validation that uh, later stage investors kind of like the deal flow we're creating. Uh, so the goal of Founders Factory is to uh, foster a better tech startup ecosystem in Columbus. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur for the last eight, nine years, and I've done stints on the enterprise corporate side and on the startup side. So going back to the early 90s, I did my first real startup in Southern California. I was a service provider. Built that up over the course of about four and a half years and sold it. Um, moved to the Midwest from Southern California after getting married. Um, didn't really know how to do a startup in the Midwest, so I joined uh, LexisNexis. And Reed Elsevier worked there for a while, got the startup bug, jumped into the startup scene down in Cincinnati. Did another startup called Synchrony Communications. Um, and that uh, imploded very nicely when the bubble burst and destroyed all kinds of value. We had over 40 million venture in that deal and it eventually sold for $300,000, so that was not a good one. Um, I had a lot of failures as well. Uh, let's, let's talk more about those and the successes. Uh, well, that was, uh, that was one where you take on too much money and spend crazily and not at all lean and agile and nimble. Um, a lot of our customers were Silicon Valley startups, so when the bubble burst and all of them started going out of business, we started losing all of our business. Um, and we really didn't have a plan for that. It was some bad economic times. Um, that was acquired by Divine Adventures out of Chicago, that had also acquired US Web, Whitman Hart, um, and us. They then went under, and everything just got really ugly. So you started the hell of a chain reaction, it sounds like. Well, I don't think we started that. I think uh, Phil Kowski, the guy at uh, Divine, did pretty well on his own right. So after that, I actually spent five years working at American Financial Group in a corporate role. Uh, just had another, had my second kid, and decided that I needed to reduce my risk profile a little bit. And I uh, spent five years there. Woke up after five years thinking, "Holy shit, I'm inside of an insurance company!" And uh, jumped into this opportunity in Chicago that uh, took to a liquidity event. Um, so, and, and since that point, I've uh, not really looked back. So. Do you think? It, I actually want to touch on something you mentioned there because I think it's important. That it comes up every once in a while. Do you think it's easier to start a startup in good times um, versus um, bad times? Or do you think that, that it, it ultimately matters 
when you're trying to do it or the environment you're trying to do it in. It just matters who's doing it and what you're doing, or do you think that there are some times that are, that are better than others to, to pursue something if indeed you're going to do that? Um, that's a great question. As far as starting it up, I think you know, whether it's going to be successful or not, I think might depend upon the macro environment from an economics perspective. It might be easier uh, to start one up. Uh, so I started Mobile Weight in October 2008, which was right at the bottom of everything pretty much. Uh, and that one was probably my second most successful startup that I've done. Uh, so timing couldn't have been worse on that one. But I think we actually solved a real pain point. So I think if you have a real pain point that you're solving, regardless of the sort of economic conditions, that's really the key. Because if you're solving a pain point for somebody that they really need solved, then you've got a, a leg up despite you know, sort of economic conditions. Um, I think from a capital access perspective, it might be easier in better economic times, but uh, capital access in the Midwest is such a drudgery and so difficult anyways, I'm not sure it really matters. You've got to be scrappy, bootstrap, really lean uh, in general. So I think we might actually be positioned better for bad economic times and doing startups. Okay, that's interesting. The, uh, what role does Founders Factory play in the startup ecosystem in Columbus? How do you work with Tech Columbus? How do you work with uh, VC firms? Uh, how do you work with the other players, you know, the third frontier, you know, et cetera? How do you work with the other players in the ecosystem? So we work uh, very closely with Tech Columbus, Ohio State University, uh, NCT Ventures, CCAD, uh, Columbus 2020, um, and the Ohio New Entrepreneurship Fund. That's the fund that actually backs the 10 accelerator program that we've been working on. Uh, so that is one of the things that um, I wanted to do with Founders Factory was try and be sort of the Switzerland, the glue that can stitch all these other constituencies together and try and uh, get people to collaborate more in the community. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, we led through 10X and Founders Factory that accepted uh, one of the first, if not the first, syndicated uh, investment deal between Tech Columbus and others in the community, NCT Ventures and Founders Factory and some angels. Uh, so, uh, collaborate very closely from a uh, life cycle of a startup perspective. Founders Factory is at the very early stage. So we're looking at concept, very early stage opportunities, uh, typically the first money in. Uh, when I first started uh, talking about doing Founders Factory from a capital access perspective, <clears throat> I talked to some of the other older folks in town and they're like, well, yeah, that early stage stuff that you're talking about, that's friends and family and fools. Tools. Um, but then you go talk to somebody who's the 20 something or the 30 something aspiring entrepreneur and say, you know, what do you need help with? And they consistently, across all my customer discussions, and I consider the entrepreneurs to be our customers, <clears throat> I heard consistently three things early stage capital, and I said, well, that's friends and family. And like, well, my friends and family don't have any money. I'm still under a mountain of debt from my college degree. My parents put me through college. I work two jobs. Uh, I can't get credit cards. I don't have any house to mortgage. So I, that early stage capital is necessary. Um, it was the advice and mentorship piece that, that consistently comes across as the number one value add of what we provide. And then also assistance with product and technology. So I consistently heard those three things. And I thought it was interesting. I never heard like, oh, we need space. Everybody's we need space, so Founders Factory doesn't actually provide space. We have a space, it's mainly you know, meeting rooms, and uh, we have a couple of conference rooms and a couple of uh, companies that are in our space, but we're not an incubator, we're not a co-working co space or anything like that. That's not what I heard was necessary. It was early stage capital, advice and help, and assistance with technology and product. And that's sort of what we've been focused on for the last few years. So what do you call, because the, the, there's, and this comes up virtually, and, in every conversation, you know, incubator, accelerator, uh, are, are, how, how do you look at Founders Factory in, in the current, you know, um, label vernacular, if you will, when 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 someone says, "What is Founders Factory?" How do you how do you answer that question? Uh, I say we provide early stage capital, we provide advice and mentorship, and we help with product and technology, uh, and we run an accelerator program uh, with Tim with Tim Accelerator. Uh, we're not an accelerator, we're not an incubator. We're a group of angels, uh, 
entrepreneurs that have been there and done that. We believe in building a better ecosystem. We believe in collaborating broadly across the whole ecosystem. And if I'm talking to an investor, what I say is we're looking to produce a higher quantity and a higher quality of deal flow for later stage investors. So one of the other things that I heard, so I was talking to the entrepreneurs who are really my customer, I also have investors that are a key part of that ecosystem. And rewinding about two, three years when we were starting this, I was hearing the lamentations of the investors that there's no deal flow, there's no deal flow, there's bad deal flow. So, and they were they were like, well, we need, we need more capital. We've got plenty of capital. We need entrepreneurs that are willing to jump in and create. So we're doing a lot of what I call spade work. We're down in the trenches at the earliest stage, you know, taking things out of startup weekend. I mean, it's a 54-hour event, right? So you've got something that's baked for 54 hours, and we've actually invested in two of those. Um, now, they're, one of them is not what went through startup weekend. And it pivots and pivots and pivots, but we're betting on a bit on the people. <clears throat> Um, and all of them have a tendency to do that. So we're trying to you know, build that ecosystem from the very earliest stages because if you're a later stage investor, you can't sit there and go, well, there's no deal flow and the deal flow sucks and not know where deal flow, I mean, it comes from people starting. It comes from ideas on the back of a napkin that somebody gets a passion about and goes to try and make it happen. That's where the deal flow starts. Ultimately, it's not that complicated, right? I don't think it is. Um, so, you know, Founders Factory has a connotation of, uh, you know, you know, people come, you know, people with ideas come in the front door, and through, you know, working with you, they, they go out the back door with some level of success, viability, sustainability. Um, it, 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 when that isn't the case, when people don't go out the back door as, as being viable and ready for, for the next step in the evolution of that company, why don't they? What 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 are, what are they doing wrong? Is it just the idea was bad? Is it it's all my fault? Uh, I'm not trying to put paint you in that light because I'm sure it goes up to you. Everybody who out the back door successful. No, it's uh, um, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one is bad idea and no ability to pivot to something that works. Uh, that's not infrequent. The other is not a good entrepreneur. Get a lot of that. Uh, not everybody can do it, it's not for everyone. Um, those are probably the two most common. Um, some will be, you know, and time will tell. You know, uh, some may be unable to get follow on investment because they couldn't get the investment and they didn't believe in their concept even though they were a decent entrepreneur with a decent idea. That's the one where time will tell. And then the ones where we did manage to get them out the back door and hand them off to the next stage of investment, which is typically NCT or Tech Columbus or, uh, um, OTAF, uh, time will tell whether those were actually good picks or not. Um, but, the, but the failures typically are bad ideas or just not good entrepreneurs. When you say not a good entrepreneur, what do you mean by that? Um, not, uh, not passionate enough about chasing their dream and their idea, chasing their vision, not, not visionary enough. Uh, typically it represents itself with the minute that you're running low on cash or you're out of cash, you go get a job immediately. Um, and the sooner that happens before the cash runs out, the, I'd say the worse entrepreneur you are. If you, can, if you see it coming six months away and you're already looking for a job because you know six months from now your startup's going to be out of money, that's a bad entrepreneur. Because that means you're not working on, like, I got six months to run away. You know, entrepreneur, go, I got six months to make this thing work. What am I going to do to make this work? Not, I have six months to find a job. And we learn that as well. That, that would be, that's probably the biggest thing that ticks me off. You, you put money in and you're betting on the idea of the person and then you find out the person, instead of working on the idea, is furnishing a resume and trying to get a job. So have, have you stumbled across the magic formula of making good bets on people? Can, can you, is there any way to tell somebody that, who's committed and who's passionate and who's going to, go through those dark days versus somebody that isn't? Or do you just have to get there and live it with that person and and some and, and most won't make it and, and and some will rise to the challenge? Is there any way to sort of, you know, look into someone's DNA and figure out whether they're gonna be that person? Um, in certain stages, yes. Uh, we have several things that we do on the front end. Of, you know, somebody comes to us wants to engage and they've got this fantastic next great idea. Um, and they want us to invest. 
uh, we screen there, just basically saying, okay, here's your homework. And a bunch of people never bother to do their homework and never come back. And if you can't, like, fill out a business plan or this is model canvas or tell us what your competitive landscape looks like or anything like that, do some basic research. Um, spend a couple hours. Work is hard. It works hard. So that's one. That's the earliest screen that we've got. Um, things like 10 Accelerator really are in a big way uh, screens for entrepreneurs. So look, you're funded enough to sort of have you know, ramen lifestyle over a 10 week period. You've got the whole community sort of falling all over themselves as if you're the bell of the ball and you're popular and everybody loves you and they're working with you. Um, what happens like the first few weeks after 10X is another, there's high infant mortality rate on these things, especially coming out of something like an accelerator. So if somebody bails on their opportunity just a couple weeks after coming out of something like 10X, you know, that's, that's a good, good sign that they're not cut out for it. Um, but later stage, uh, I think probably, um, I may not be the best person to be asking that because I play at that early stage. So I can tell you I'm sort of what my early stage gates are, but you know, guys at Tech Columbus could probably tell you, okay, you know, the seed stage investment, this is what we're looking for. Um, I know it's uh, you know, things they look for because I've been through that gauntlet myself or 100% dedicated and committed to it. You're not doing side jobs, you don't have a second job, those types of things. Um, but the, those are the two big ones from my perspective is if you come, if you go through our program, either 10X or through the Founders Factory off cycle, uh, or you can't even complete the pre work in order for us to actually get you into our pipeline and decide whether we want to work with you or not. Those are the two, two quick knockouts. What, uh, from both a Founders Factory and 10X perspective, won't what won't you guys look at? Um, and, and are you only focused on tech-based companies and software-based companies? Yes. Um, <clears throat> on the Founders Factory side, it's, uh, we're a little looser on what we'll look at, mainly because Founders Factory and the funds that we manage may not invest in it, but we've got a number of angels that uh, will maybe invest individually in things. Uh, but in general, we are set up for internet technology, software-based solutions. Uh, and, and 10 Accelerator, we've gone through four iterations on that and have been seeking the focus. So we started out the first class, we had mostly IT-based companies, internet-based companies. We had one drug delivery system, then we had one green energy company. Uh, we had lessons from that in that you can't really do much in 10 weeks and $20,000 at that point. It was 12 weeks for a green energy company. So. No more green energy companies, at least from a 10x perspective. The second class, we focused a little more, saying, okay, it needs to be internet technology, software. Uh, the third, and I've comes from a question I've been asking in the Columbus community for a while, is what is it that makes Columbus special? What makes us different? What gives us an advantage in the overall market? What can we do here that can't be replicated in Austin, New York? Dallas, San Francisco, LA. Um, and I've talked to hundreds of people and asked that question. And I've probably gotten about as many answers as there are people. Uh, and we started thinking about that on our third program. What can we do here? And we did a lot from a design perspective. It was hosted by CCAD, so we really thought design might be uh, an element of that. And I think there is some merit to that. The last class, the one that we just ran, we basically said, okay, look, we've heard from enough people that, and we're not complete idiots, we think there are four areas where Columbus may have an advantage, so let's try each of those four and see if any of them have you know, good success. Okay, I'll buy you. What are the four? That's where I was going. Great question. Uh, educational technology, so we've got some track record with accepted and edu-sourced as examples, plus if you look at the footprint of uh, universities, higher education, uh, Magnet schools or the STEM schools, all that. We've got a lot of education here at McGraw Hill, highlights, all of that. So that's one we think maybe an advantage. And honestly, in that, it's not really exciting and compelling for investors, but it's true. That is what it is. It is what it is. Um, the other one was uh, cybersecurity. So we thought there would be an advantage there. There's a very vibrant uh, community of practitioners here with Nationwide and Huntington and Chase and Cardinal. And Financial and CDC, and, um, and then Battelle has a whole cybersecurity research unit that does all kinds of stuff that they can't tell us what they do. Um, but maybe we'll be able to 
commercial like some of it. So cybersecurity is another one. Um, retail. Uh, so you think of limited, limited brands, Abercrombie, and all that stuff. There's really, from a retail fashion perspective, we should be able to. That's that's the one in my mind. That's like, duh. Um, but we're not really seeing a lot of stuff happen there. We've I mean, got a few success stories we can point to, like Jack Barrett's, for example. Not that they came through 10x, but. Um, and then the fourth one. data analytics, and that's because all the, you know, the IBM Center and all the focus on large enterprises that are focused on big data and the programs coming out of Ohio State, that type of stuff. So those are the four focus areas that we recruited on. Um, we ended up getting, we had a couple that were in the sort of fashion retail space. We had uh, a couple that were hybrids. We had one that was a hybrid between big data and cybersecurity, which is interesting, and they're actually doing pretty well. They managed to raise follow-on funding after 10x, and they're still going. Um, we had a couple that were, uh, one that was in the gaming space, um, which I thought was interesting. There's actually a lot of stuff in the gaming space going on in town recently. Um, so we had a, we had a mixed, mixed bag. Uh, I don't think we got, we got nothing on the educational technology side this time around. So, and a lot of that is what are we able to recruit and what's the quality of that recruiting? So we typically will recruit. Uh, so the two differences, uh, on the 10X side, it's a program that runs at a specified date for a period specific period of time. Um, that we do the whole marketing and recruiting to recruit. We'll get a couple hundred applications and whittle that down to 10. On the Founders Factory side, we don't really run on an academic calendar or program. We'll take people when they come knock on our door or come to our website. Actually, I had a group out of OSU, maybe even run into these folks, came and knocked on the door and sitting in my office. So this is Founders Factory. This is Founders Factory. The guy's got a PowerPoint deck printed out. He's all like nervous. He's like, I've got this great idea. It's a uh, Edible coffee cup. Um, now, to be fair, I gave him sort of the first screening task of here, go do a business model canvas and tell us about your team and what your capital requirements are for the next 12 months and what the kind of landscape looks like. They actually did it turn around pretty quickly. So, and if you could get your fiber and your caffeine at the same time, I mean, uh, I, mean I get it. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with the rest of you. Uh, the, the, so, you, you don't, if, if someone knocks on your door while you're screening and taking applications for 10x, do you, does everybody within that 10x period that you want to work with get put into 10x? Or even if someone knocks on your door while you're looking for 10x, will you work with them outside of 10x just as Founders Factory? Did that make sense? I yeah, I, I know what you're asking. So we'll get 200 and some odd applications during uh, the 10x recruiting period. We'll only select 10 of those. Um, and when we're running 10X, we're pretty much 100% dedicated towards running 10X. So we're not trying to juggle other Founders Factory stuff outside of 10X because 10X requires so much resources to pull off. Um, so it's not like we've got, well, you're really good. Don't go 10X, go Founders Factory. It's, um, we pretty much funnel everything towards 10X. And it actually, as we're leading up to that, we've had ones that we're, we like, we're like, probably not great for Founders Factory at this point. Why don't you apply to 10X and there's a good chance you'll get in? So we've had some of that. Um, we're not that we're less selective on the 10X side, but we have more resources available because there's the one fund behind it, and we have to do 10. Um, 10 is not well. We have to, but if we don't, then we've got to figure out what to do with the extra money the state gave us, and we're not going to spend it on ourselves. You can't make it up as you go along. No. So. I think I answered your question. I hope you Yeah, I think you did. Um, as people come out of, of you know, 10x, is the is the objective of 10x for them to to go and get uh, you know uh, another round of funding or an institutional round? What is the goal of someone coming out of 10x? Yeah. So the goal of 10x is to validate the problem and hopefully identify a first customer uh, for most of them. Some companies come in at different stages, uh, and typically that involves creating some type of prototype that they can get in front of customers. So the, the goal of 10X, and actually the goal of a lot of what we do at Founders Factory is the stage that we play at is trying to validate that there's a problem we're solving. So it's a very early stage of sort of customer discovery, problem validation, and potential solution definition. Uh, when you get to the end of what Founders Factory provides or 10X provides, the plan is for you to graduate on 
graduate on to the next stage of investors. So we're looking to hand them off to a Tech Columbus or maybe to an NCT Ventures or someone like that or a fast switch who can make that next stage of investment, provide the next stage of support and continue to work with them. How does someone, if someone wants to approach you about engaging outside of 10X, so as Founders Factory, what's the best way for them to, to do that and what should they be prepared with when they're reaching out? Um, probably the website is, uh, it's got sort of a lot of information around what we're looking for, what our expectations are, and you can go and apply there. Um, and then typically you know, we've got this sort of all can, sort of can process that we run through where you contact us, we'll send back and say, okay, here's five things we need. Those five things are a business model canvas, 12 month P&L, and probably isn't gonna be any revenue there. We're not looking for a hockey stick in the first 12 months. Um, a market competitive analysis, who's on the team, and what is it that you need that you think we can provide. And that's the starting point. And half the people we ask for that don't bother to provide that. That's that first screen. Really? Half? Yeah, about half. So they'll go through the, they'll, they'll contact us through the website. We'll follow back up with them. In many cases, we'll actually sit down with them and walk through uh, the five things we need, help them sort of begin work on the business model canvas, uh, begin work on a competitive analysis of where the resources, you know, Google um, and other Hoovers and things like that. Uh, Probably about half don't actually finish the five things we ask for, which is that that, that falls in the category of you know, a not good entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, we sort of come full circle on that one. Um, if, if you're afraid to do the work, then you're probably ultimately not going to make it. Um, talk about talk about the, the a big piece of what Founders Factory does, in, and even as part of 10x, is sort of the advising and the mentoring and the support. Talk about your, your team a little bit and, and the, the kind of mentoring and support and advising that, that you give people either as part of Founders Factory or 10 or both. Yeah, so uh, we've managed to recruit a mentor network of around 100 people at this point. Um, there's a core team at Founders Factory, uh, and there's uh, five or six of us, seven of us. Depends on, depends on if you count investors versus people that will actually jump in and roll their sleeves and work with you. So you're saying investors don't do any real work? I didn't say that, um, but not at, not at the level that some of the core folks will. I mean, I, I just came off of two years of working a good chunk of my time with one portfolio company. Most investors don't do that. Um, so the, the core team at Founders Factory is myself, Ray Sheely, Matt Armstead, Todd Whittington, David Hanania, Greg Roof, that's everybody. And then we've got a couple other folks that have joined as investors, but they're not really active doing the mentor piece, and Daniel Sad and Tad Sites. Uh, so they help with deal flow, they help with screening, they make decisions on investments, they'll sidecar, those types of things. But Daniel Sad is CEO and founder of Solomon Moss, so he's kind of busy growing that business. And Tad Sites is probably one of the most active angels in town. He's in tons of deals and he's retired. Um, he used to be CEO of Scott's. Um, so there, that's the core team, and we typically look for one of the core team to be a champion for the particular company coming in, if they're coming to Founders Factory. Uh, and then we'll tap our mentor network based upon their needs and you know, whether they need help with capital access planning, financing, they need help with market analysis, they need help getting the first customers. So that, that's often the biggest value that we can get is getting industry industry knowledgeable subject matter expertise out of the network or introductions to potential prospects and first customers. Um, on the 10X side, the broader mentor network gets a lot more engaged uh, and that's the difference between sort of Founders Factory, we're at it all the time, and 10X is more of a 10 week program. Um, within 10X, if we recruit someone in, they, to, to be part of the mentor network, they'll sign up to one of three levels, we have three different levels that you can get participate at. Level one is what we call a specialist. Uh, as part of the program, we have like weekly themes each week. So one week might be storytelling, and the next week might be product management, and the next week might be sales, and the next week might be social media marketing or marketing in general. So for each one of those weeks, we'll have a specialist or a pair of specialists come in, and their commitment is, I'll show up for you know, three hours on Wednesday, 
I'll talk and then answer questions, and then I'm done. They're out. They might make themselves available if you have follow-on questions through email or something like that. That's, that's the least level of involvement that we ask from the mentors. Second level is uh, a mentor, um, and those are people that will sort of bop in and out during the program. They might develop an affinity towards one or two of the companies. They're generally committing to a couple hours a week over the course of the 10 weeks. And then the top level of involvement is what we call the lead advisor. And that's typically somebody who's like spending a day a week with one specific company, really helping them dig in and, and, and work on their problem, solution, market fit type stuff. Um, and in those cases, those people oftentimes will follow on after the program ends, and we like to see that when they follow on after that, maybe join board of advisors. Uh, in some cases, we've had people jump into uh, executive chairman roles where they're 50% dedicated towards the company for a period of time, helping them raise capital and grow sales. Uh, that's what we do with Accepted. So in the case of Accepted, there were two of us in founders that jumped in um, and, and helped the founders of that company get to the point where uh, they could stand on their own and go and run. Uh, so that's sort of the flavor of the mentor level involvement and how we get them engaged. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and you mentioned mobile weight as, as um, one of your successes. Uh, talk about even as part of mobile weight, um, if if indeed you know you had a point or multiple points with it where you know it just looked like it wasn't going to work, and, and you know um, it, you know you weren't sure that it was going to ultimately be successful, and how you and, and what the issue was, if you will, and then. How you overcame it, or, or you know, how you just you know maybe just you know fought through it so that ultimately the company was successful. Yeah. So success there was that was a success from the perspective of it went to a liquidity event and provided a return on equity for the founders. Um, so there were several points during that. It was really a struggle to raise capital and getting someone to believe you and invest in the company. That was very very hard. That was one of the things that really made me want to work on Founders Factory was the, the capital access piece was and, and the validation piece. Uh, there were several points um, during that in the, in the 2009 time frame after we founded in 2008. Uh, we managed to get to a certain level with clients. You know, we managed to land a few dozen clients, had our product in the field, it was working well, um, but just the cost of acquisition and the amount of effort for acquisition was a bit of a challenge. And uh, we actually ran out of runway. I e ran out of money. Ran out of money. So um, my partner went and got a job. My business partner and I got, went and got a job, and then my spouse, my wife, said, "Well, you got a job. You should get a job." What are you doing? Wink, 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 wink. So right about that same time, I was approached by a gentleman at Cardinal Health who offered me a job, and uh, in order to not get divorced, uh, <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but in order to keep uh, the sanity on the home front, um, I actually took that job. Uh, I worked at Cardinal for three months uh, because about a week after going to Cardinal, uh, we got a call from a group in Denver that was very interested in acquiring mobile weight. Uh, and the time I was at Cardinal was about the amount of time it took to negotiate the deal, and then I left. So that one was one of those where um, we actually managed to get to the point where we had investment coming from Tech Columbus. So they had committed to a half million dollar investment in us. It took us about 18 months to get to that point, um, which was helpful. Uh, a lot of details in that, um, but the reason that uh, my partner went to get the job and I took the job is that we were actually going to put a different management team in place because of compensation restrictions that were imposed by investors. Um, but that half a million of investment that we had sitting there provided a great uh, negotiating position with the acquirer. So we could say, hey, you know, we believe in this, we're going to go and take this capital down and we're going to go get this done and launch it really grow this company. So if you want to acquire us, you need to negotiate good faith. So we negotiated really well on that. And we were acquired into a, a guy that was rolling up solutions in the restaurant space and integrating them into a uh, full suite of solutions for restaurants. So you could go you know, one shop, one stop shop for loyalty, gift cards, e-gift, websites, social media, guest management, reservations, uh, POS, all of that in one solution. And it was actually something that was tied very closely to the payments industry, which we never saw as being working 
in the front of the house restaurant solution. We never thought that a payments provider would be the place that we could exit it at. So, um, and there were several points where that you stare sort of death in the face, um, figure out what you're going to do. And uh, a lot of it was uh, you know, how do we acquire more customers to get revenue ramping in an efficient fashion? How do we raise capital in order to get to that point? Um, and then how do you do that without having your spouse want to kick you out of the house or kick you to the couch or I'm not a 20-something entrepreneur anymore. My first company I did was, you know, I slept on a futon on the floor, and I lived off of ramen. And I like to say that when you're in that young stage and you don't have a spouse and kids and a mortgage, and you have very little to lose, so why not roll the dice and go big? Whereas you get sort of longer the tooth and older, and you get kids and mortgages and things like that, it becomes a lot more risky, especially if you're in that middle stage where you know, later in life, you've hopefully managed to amass some wealth and create a war chest that you can burn into while you're working on your visionary idea. But in that mid-stage where you may not have built that war chest yet, it's uh, much riskier. Uh, oh, Doug. Maybe it was just on, on pause for so long that it turned off. Um, I was just, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember that. Talk more next time. Sam talking too much? Uh, no, that was not the inference at all. Uh, the, uh, uh, the that point about sort of um, you know entrepreneurial you know age seems to come up all the time, where you know it's you know it's a young person's game you know kind of a thing. Um, it, yeah, it, do you think it really is just because it's a fact of of where someone is in the in the cycle of life, if you will, that, that younger people can can take more risks and, and can place you know a, a bet that, that you know other people can't necessarily you know take the risk you know associated to it. Um, I I think there's I mean you have to decide for yourself where you are in your life stage and you can decide what risk you're willing to take. Because I think there are, there are definitely benefits to doing it as, as an older person, right? You've got industry knowledge and expertise. You've got a much broader network. You hopefully have you know, better relationships, um, subject matter expertise in particular areas because you've sort of been out there longer. Um, I'd say you know, kind of like the ideal is you don't want someone like right out of college. You probably want somebody who's got some years of experience in a particular industry who sees a problem and has a way to develop us. A vision for a solution to that problem. Uh, so probably, you know, if I were to say, you know, perfect target would be late twenties, early thirties. Um, you know, because you've got some experience, you've got some subject matter expertise under your belt, um, but you're still in the sort of early stages where you can take some risks without having to drag a spouse and kids and everything else along. For, for some folks, I am married in my late twenties, and I had my first kid when I was thirty. So, um, but I'd already done one startup in my 20s and sold it. So um, I also think it varies by region. I mean, you look at Silicon Valley and all the hype out there and everything, and it's always the 19-year-old billionaire now or 25-year-old billionaire. Um, Damn those people. Well, they're, it's high because they're so rare. Anyways. And they're rare for getting, you know, just set aside the age and demographics. It's just rare in general. So to... I don't know what the age of the guys is the, the WhatsApp or they didn't look really young. Um, yeah, I think I read that he was like 37 or 38, something like that. Right. So I think it comes down to, you know, I think if you're an entrepreneur, you can do it at any stage in your life. It's just you have to manage risk differently. Uh, and there are people that have been serial entrepreneurs and have stayed in it or people like me that have sort of swung back and forth over the course of their career. Uh, I think I'm in a good place to be doing stuff right now. And I'll, I go and I talk to investors, they may be you know, more attracted to someone who's younger because while well, they're not going to be old and slow, they're more energetic, they're going to get earlier, stand later, and work harder. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, so I, I don't know if there are any. There's definitely advantages and disadvantages to um, somebody who's 50. Um, particularly if they've got good industry connections and expertise, then the question becomes, can they, could they, can they be an entrepreneur? Can they actually have a vision, get an idea, and bring it to fruition? 
because if they've waited till 50 to do that and they're you know, fully corporate culture and they're used to there's a you know, hired hired people, not that 50 is bad, I'm almost 50 myself, but you hire someone in who's been in that and you're like, oh, I want to do I'm finally at the point where you know, I'm an empty nester and I've got a war chest and I'm going to do the startup. And then you bring them in and say, okay, all right, I need you to do this. And go around looking for their administrative assistant. Where's my admin? Where's my admin? Um, I want to throw it out for, for questions. Jay? So you said you had 1.2 million capital for this one startup. So what is that deal size? What's the range now? Yeah, the average deal was around $30,000, $35,000. So we've done a lot of deals. But when you're doing them 10 at a time. Yeah, Alex? Uh, do you invest in LLC? We invest predominantly in LLCs. Uh, that later stage stuff of being C corps or whatever usually gets cleaned up. We're we're doing debt and we're doing convertible debt instruments. It's predominantly what we're using to deploy the capital, um, and it's I'd say probably ninety percent, eighty five percent LLCs. Uh, they're quick, easy to set up. They're real cheap, um, pretty well understood. Later stage investors, once they get to a Series A, when we're converting, that's the company will typically. Do you typically look for and do you care um, about what the founding team looks like? Um, it can it be one person or if a you know group of, of six people show up that, that they're all playing you know a really key role in bringing key skills. Do you care what the founding team looks like? Well, it's one of our five questions: is what's the team? Um, five or five or six would be a lot. I don't think I've seen a founding team that large. Yeah, I should have made that up. Huh? But I, we had that one team that came in. It was that many people. But by the time it actually got brass tacks, it, it was down to three. Um, it, it, it varies. Uh, it's, it's good to see, I think, a pair or three are good. More than three, you start to worry about dilution and interest and value brought by people when you get a team that large at the founding and initial stage. Uh, one is also a challenge, but you can get over that if they're really motivated and sharp. You can surround them with the right people. Particularly if they've got sort of that sense, we got the sense that they've got some entrepreneurial DNA, uh, they're coachable, um, and we can help them strategically. Do you care whether the founders have the technical capability as part of the founding team um, or not? So if they if they have an idea but they don't have the ability to bring that to fruition because they don't have a technical co-founder. Um, do you care or do you want them to be bringing, uh, if, it, if it's an application or software based company, you want them to be bringing not only the business but the technical expertise as part of the founding team? I think the subject matter expertise and the business vacuum are a lot more important. We don't necessarily care. And that's one of the third things that we provide is that product and technology for people who need it. Um, our path has been if you don't have that, we can provide it. And typically, the way it runs is we'll provide it for about 18 to 24 months. And what happens within 18 to 24 months is either it's dead and doesn't matter, or they've gotten to a point where they've got enough traction, enough investment, enough revenue and customers that they can bring that team in. And we actually work with uh, you know, our portfolio companies that are using our product and technology uh, services. We work with them to help bring on their technical co-founders, not a founder anymore because you're you know, a year into it at this point. And then have them work as part of the broader team, and then transition over time um, to an internal team. So it sounds like, based upon the numbers you reviewed, that your average uh, investment is somewhere around 30, 30 to thirty-five k. Uh, that's average. So what, what you know, what will you go up to on the high side, and what's your minimum that you'll that you'll do from a capitalization perspective? We've done, I think, up to seventy-five, maybe a hundred. Yeah, and we've done. As low as ten. Okay. Do you really want to be at that sweet spot of you know, let's say thirty k, or or are you okay, you know, giving 10, 12 k, you know, sort of on a regular basis? Yeah, I think we we the the ten I think we've done once. Most falls between twenty to thirty five, and we've done seventy five once or twice, you know, hundred once. So that that middle area, I would uh, if I had to go back and do it over again. 
this, and not every company we invested in was one that I voted yes for. Not that I'm always right. Not always wrong, but I'm not always right. Um, I think I'd rather, if we were to wipe the slate clean and start over again, I would probably do larger deal size, fewer deals, and get much more involved with those fewer deals. What, what area do you, um, the companies um, th that you engage with, where do they need the most help? Is it technical? Is it business? Is it financial? Is it sort of looking at, is it customer acquisition? Where do they typically need the most help? Business model, customer acquisition, um, and we do see people needing a lot of help with product and technology. Um, mainly product more so than technology. You can find a developer, maybe. Uh, but making sure- Raise more money. You can find a developer to hire, right? You're right. Um, challenge there is making sure that what you're having built is really a product and not just technology. It's, it's a product knowledge, product management capability. Um, but it's mainly a lot of the help is around business, product management, you know, sort of business model. How do I make money? How does this actually turn into a business as opposed to just a technology product? Um, and then customer acquisition, go to market, how do I sell? Probably the two biggest things that following from that would be the, you know, the product piece and then technology pretty quickly after that. It's interesting you brought up, you broke out products separately from technology. It, so clearly you, you look at those and view those as two different things and two different disciplines, if you will, with, within a company. Um, the, I, I think most people, especially in a technology-based company, would, would look at their technology and a product as the same thing. How do you, uh, how do you look at those two things as, as different disciplines? How do, you, how do you look at the product separately from the technology? Well, the, in my mind, the product is what are the features that are solving the problem that create the solution for the problem you're trying to solve? So it's a kind of requ requirements gathering, if you will, and making sure that, that before you build something, you're going to yeah. build something that somebody's going to want. Yep. It's prioritization around feature sets, managing timelines, managing milestones, managing. It's a combination of product and project management. For the technology, it's down to, okay, we're going to use .NET platform or PHP or Ruby on Rails, or this is going to be a mobile app, so it's going to be phone gap or blah, 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 how do so I think they're both important, but where there's just so many options on the technology side. So whether I build it in .NET or PHP or Ruby on Rails or C++, a good, a good technologist will be able to pick the right solution for the right, you know, the right tool for the right, the right problem. On the product side, it's really understanding the business need, what problem are you trying to solve, what does the customer need from a features and roadmap perspective prioritizing appropriately, knowing that you have a lot of uncertainty, it's about testing, it's about um, prioritization, it's about being lean and focused around the product itself as opposed to the technology. Is, in your mind, is that where the customer acquisition and the sales begins, is actually in that product sort of development and product management life cycle? Yes. The, the customer, I think, you know, we have some people come in and they're like, I got this great idea. Just as a quick aside, most founders are product people. They've got an idea for some product or service that they, now whether they're good at product management or not is a whole other discussion, but they're thinking about a product. I've got some product or service that I can bring to market. And if I do that, it'll be the best thing to slice bread and we're gonna be wealthy. Um, so that was my aside. What was your question again? Um, Shit, I got caught up in the aside too, and I forgot my question. Yeah. Yeah. If you can give a specific example, like for instance, the success, what do you think was maybe the top one or two things that that the two founders of Axis yourself actually really did? Obviously, they had something going. Yep. Yeah. Two energetic guys, but what would they what did you really do? Well, they had there were two energetic guys, and they actually had identified a pain point that needed to be solved. They had no idea how to do product management and how to do technology. They had worked with a technology and design a design house basically 
to do some good work around user experience and logo and identity and stuff like that. The first version of our product couldn't handle even a single user though. So there was, that, that would be technology. Um, from a product perspective, they were pretty well positioned because they had spent time interviewing customers, putting mocks in front of customers, saying, hey, seeing how they interact with the product. That's product management as opposed to technology. So they had, they had technology issues. They also had uh, some product issues after their first initial version. So that's where I jumped in. So we ended up scrapping the, what I would call barely a mock or a prototype that they tried to take to market and, and build a scalable version and then help them with the product side around a, a roadmap, prioritized roadmap that's gonna meet additional feature requirements that are gonna make them competitive in the market and solve the need. Greg provided uh, a lot of the business strategy, came up with the business model, uh, did a lot of the strategic alliances that positioned them well in the market with uh, channel partners um, and helped them land their first probably 100 accounts. Um, and then some of those closed himself. Yeah, and that goes with I remember the class. You know, if, if you, at this age, if you give me, you know, four minutes, I'll remember the previous question. Um, it was, the, does the customer acquisition process actually begin during product sort of development? Yeah, okay, so where I was going to go is that, okay, now I know where I'm at. Go back on. We, so the next month, we might need somebody younger to sit up here with us. So, Knowing that most founders are product people and they've got this idea of what the product is in their head, their tendency is to go, I just need somebody who can code this damn thing and I'll get it done, right? And that's where we go, okay, that's great, you've got an idea in your head, let's go out and actually talk to prospects and customers and see if they like your idea, see if they'll buy your idea, see if they'll use your idea, and see if they'll pay for your idea. Um, and that's, uh, that's a big part of it. So it's around validation. Um, and I'm a very big proponent of like only build as much as you need to to get in front of a customer to get that next bit of feedback to figure out what the next step is. Uh, being very efficient with the resources because it's very easy to go off and if you got a visionary product person, they, you can spend tens, hundreds, millions of dollars building their vision and not interacting with any customers to find out whether it's actually solving the problem you think it is. They're going to engage. They're going to want to use it. They're going to want to pay to use it. Do, do you think, because that's one of the things that I see a lot, is people, one, it, it, it's, you have to fight human nature not to overbuild, right, based upon what, what you really just need to have at the beginning to uh, provide value to users and to get somebody to want it. It's just human nature because I think it's fear of rejection, fear of somebody's going to reject me that it doesn't do enough or they're going to reject my idea or my thing because it doesn't do enough. So I think there's there's a fear of rejection that we're trying to overcome there. The other part of that is that it's it for most founders who haven't been in any sort of sales or business development role prior to you know their idea and, and trying to launch, they're not that comfortable going out and taking mock-ups and sort of requirements in front of people and dealing with that feedback and the rejection and you know and, and figuring out oh, they didn't like this but maybe they'll like this better. Um, it, how do you, you know, do you see that often and how do you help people work through that um, maybe fear of going out and, and, and being confronted with the fact that people aren't going to like, you know, their idea or, or the mock-ups that they're putting in front of them? Um, I haven't really seen a lot of issues with that, to be honest. Okay. okay. You know, people, if they bother to answer our five questions and get in, uh, the next step we ask them to is, okay, can you, you know, do you have any customer testimonials? Do you have any do you have any reference prospects that you talked to that validated that you're onto something, right? Uh, we very much look for that sort of the next stage. So that, that would be one of those other screening things. Um, How do you validate though the people that they've gone to talk to are actually right. giving them viable feedback versus them talking to people that, that they already know and, and are going to tell them it's a good idea and, and you know they would buy it just because you know they, you know, they don't want to give them negative feedback and we tell them they like it. You know, well, the next stage would be we then plug them into our network and say, okay, hey, you're talking about providing a solution for the travel industry, and we know some guys at Orbitz over in Chicago. We're going to go online with them, and you're going to pitch your pitch, and, and then we talk to them offline and see what you guys think. Maybe do, we utilize our mentor network in a number of ways. 
not just to sort of provide advice to the entrepreneurs, but also to vet and validate the ideas. Okay, gotcha. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. Any more questions? Jake, go ahead. Uh, I think it needs to be part of something larger in the community. Uh, we don't have yet, I think, a real center of gravity here as part of our tech startup ecosystem. Uh, and I don't know whether that will be, because there's talk of you know, uh, an accelerator space down in the Franklinton area or in the short north or in the downtown area. Um, I think, I think it's, it's not something that's going to stand on its own for much longer. So it needs to be integrated into the larger community. So if you look at what other uh, other accelerators have done, they're usually associated to a standing facility that has dedicated resources. Right now, we're doing each program. It's almost like Startup Weekend, except for the next level, um, where you guys don't have offices and all that other stuff. I think that in order, it needs to be part of something larger and it needs to be something that's supported more sustainably within the community. Because each time we run one of these programs, we spend you know, two thirds of our time up front and probably half of our time during the program trying to raise the funds to run the program. Even though we're like already halfway into it, we're still trying to figure out how do we cover the cost of the program. So I think it needs to be part of something that's got some gravity in the community. Uh, and that's, that's where we like it was, it sounds like if it was more constant, the overhead would be less to run it, if you will, and you'd get some efficiencies you know, out of it if it was a little bit more of an anchor kind of a program. Right, right. And well, it's also, I mean, people look at it, well, it's a 10-week program. What do you do the rest of the year? Well, it's not really. It's a, the program itself is 10 weeks, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that leads up to that around recruiting and screening and keeping the mentor network alive and keeping the brand. So it's really probably more of a nine month endeavor than a 10 week or 12 week endeavor. So there's, and, and there's lots of other stuff that you can do as part of that. I mean, we are have on the Founders Factory side where you don't have to wait for 10X to come along to submit and we'll work with you right now um, and run you through. You get some uh, economies of scale where you're running 10 companies at a time through a program as opposed to one offs that are all starting at different stages. Uh, that's one of the advantages of the, the 10X type accelerator. But I think it, it does need to be part of something that's larger and not this sort of standalone kind of thing. It just doesn't have enough uh, enough support without uh, without that. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I think uh, a lot of the really entrepreneurs are uh, sort of looking towards the future uh, in terms of, say, a few companies down the line of being in the position that you are, where you can sort of give back and work with a company, you know, having had some successes and experience in building out that network. And uh, just from your perspective, could you share a little bit of maybe what the biggest surprise was in terms of what you like or don't like about having experience starting your own uh, companies and then also working on someone else's vision or original idea and sort of what the difference is and what the difference is? Well, I've, uh, I typically work on other people's ideas. I've, uh, I've had a couple of ideas over the course of my career. Um, one was Founders Factory. Um, and all the other ones that I've done have been other. So I, I team up with idea people. And I'm about bringing order out of chaos, taking things over the finish line, um, or the operations guy. Now, as I've been doing it longer, I've been becoming more of the idea person. But uh, so. The, the difference would be, am I a founder or am I working alongside a founder? Um, it's, it's frustrating if you're not directly involved and responsible for the business, whether you're the idea person or not. For me, it's one of the things that where things aren't moving at the pace that they would be moving if I were driving, for example. I find that frustrating uh, and different. Um, but you know, everybody has their own pace and their own drive that they run at. Um, lack of control, but if it's not my real venture and I'm just a minor investor and a small piece, I worry less about it. Where if I'm 
significant owner in the company, I'm going to be much more sort of passionate and want to understand details a lot more. And, um, so I think that's probably the flip side of it. Even though I want them to go faster, like, well, you know, it's not really mine. I've only got 2% in this company. And they've got the other 98, so if they're not running, they're lost kind of thing. Um, it would be frustrating if I saw one and be like, well, that's an amazing opportunity. They're not moving fast enough yet. That hasn't, that hasn't happened. The question was, if someone comes with a couple of entrepreneurial failures, how does that factor into the thought process of working with them? Yeah, we don't work with anybody who's failed. If you fail, why don't you have a black <laughs> um, I, I'll talk like an attorney. It depends. Uh, it depends on what, what they learned from that. Were those just like outright blithering idiot failures and they didn't learn anything from it? Or are they able to talk through, like, why did it fail? What did you learn from that? What wouldn't you do again? What would you do differently? Uh, that's the important aspect to it. Um, as a general rule, if you've got a failure or two under your belt, that I would say is a good thing. Uh, but then I want to dig deeper and find out, like, did you learn from that or are you just an idiot? Yep, come back. What, what time commitment do we expect from founders? Um, it depends on what those other commitments are. So, and at the stage we're at, we're typically not investing if you've got a full-time job somewhere else. But if you're doing freelance work and things like that to make ends meet, um, and then we're open to it. Uh, I, in general, I'm very much sort of production view based. I don't care if it takes you two hours or 20 hours to get X done. If we've agreed that X needs to be done by Y date, if you get X done by Y date and got it done in two hours, good for you. If it took you 20, it sucks to be you kind of thing. So it's much more about the production piece. Now, I will tell you, if you get it done in two hours, you know, X is going to be bigger and Y is going to be shorter next time we have a talk. Um, but it comes down to, you know, what are the agreed upon milestones and deliverables and things that need to get done? And can you get those done and, and around? I mean, we understand I can't give you $30,000 and expect you to live off of that now. Um, that said, if it's done right, we've had several companies where that is the investment that we made. They got traction, got follow-on investment, we're able to get paid out of that follow-on investment, that type of thing. So um, it, it varies depending on the person. It's really about production, it's about moving the ball forward. The current environment for startups yeah. compared to dot com era. Um, I think there's a lot of parallels. Uh, I wasn't here in 2000, so I don't know. I was down in Cincinnati. Um, I think what I recall from like the 2000 time frame down in Cincinnati it was a lot crazier, wilder times than it is now. Um, though I look at what's going on with valuations and exits and levels of investment, I don't know if that's maybe it's inflation and it's adjusted for it can't be. It's inflation not been that big, but it seems to be feeling. You know, if I look at certain numbers, it looks a lot like it did back in 2000. But at least here in Columbus, it doesn't feel like Cincinnati did in 2000. Um, now, maybe if you went down to Cincinnati, it might feel like that. I don't know. Uh, but I think there's definitely a resurgence around this. And I think that people are smarter now than they were. Well, maybe not smarter, but there are, people are thinking more about bootstrapping and being lean than back then. I don't hear a lot of people. I mean, I had, I had my CEO come to me. I was running operations for this company who raised 40 million. He's like, spend, spend, spend. If you don't spend the investor's money, they're going to be upset. They're going to say we're moving too slow. So I don't see that going on right now. But it may be a similarity is that there seems to be a romance around being an entrepreneur now that we probably haven't seen since 
the early 2000s. I think that's more so now than in the past, because I don't remember this like entrepreneur on a pedestal even back in 2000, like it is now. Is that a good thing in your mind or a bad thing? I think it's a bad thing. I think it causes people that just don't have it in them to try it. You damage yourself. You ever seen a pull muscle? <laughs> you didn't have to say that while you were looking directly at me. <laughs> I got out a bit fine this morning. I'll have you know. Um, any final, any final thoughts or questions? I just had a question. Just if you had to suggest an average from the time you meet a founder and start talking seriously, how long does it take for most of your deals to produce an average of Um, about a month. That's when we were on sort of a monthly cycle. So for a while we were doing monthly meetings and monthly, but now we're going to quarterly. So if you were to Get invited to come and pitch. We usually do three or four pitches every quarter. Um, within a, within two weeks, you've got that, and that's with us doing some validation and testing. You've got term sheet, and usually within two weeks after that, you've got a check in your hand. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of He wants to steal someone's idea for you to give him money to do it and give him the mentors and support. I'm, I'm trying to think through because I've had several cases of this. I've got a couple of these right now. Like, like if you have an interest in um, so Mobile Weight, for example, I have a Mac. So the company that bought Mobile Weight went under and they were unable to make their final payments to us as part of the, the agreement to buy this product. So they said, you know, instead of us, Paying you or you, know, you suing us, how about we just give you back everything you sold us? Which is kind of cool because I got like 85% of my payment for the product and I got it all back. How did you plan it so well? I didn't plan it so well. But because uh, I planned it so well, I would have had a management team standing and ready to jump on it. You would have gotten 99% of your payback. Yeah. But uh, no. Uh, I think it fundamentally comes down to the value of ideas. And the value of ideas is, is maybe sacrilege is not much. Even with the Edison 99% perspiration, percent. not that there aren't really great ideas, but the idea is the very, very, very beginning. And often the idea, even you look at the big, big ones, like you look at Google, for example. Google was not what their, that was not their idea. Their idea was an algorithm sell for a million dollars and they couldn't get anybody to buy it. So they stood up a company and started doing it. Now they're, right? And there's case after case after case. Twitter, Twitter was not what Twitter is. It's, there's all these cases where the initial idea is not what ended up being the successful business. So ideas are not really worth a whole bunch. So if you're thinking like, I've got this really great idea and I'm gonna put a team together and give them some capital and they're gonna go do my idea. You could probably do that, but you'd better already been massively successful and had huge war chests that you can provide funding for that and put the team together. Um, and we've got several of the ones where we've invested in, they may be really good ideas, but the entrepreneur didn't pan out. So, uh, and actually some of the accelerators, like Y Combinator now says, don't bring us an idea. If you're interested in being an entrepreneur, come, we've got great ideas. And we'll, you can throw a portfolio of ideas and decide which one. So it's usually got about a three-year term on the note, eight to ten percent interest. Usually have some type of discount and cap. Do you take security interest? Not usually. I wish you would. <laughs> uh, it, it's probably. 
probably a sign that we should stop because so my mic turned off. <laughs> well, and we're talking legal terms. It's always a sign that it's over. Um, so while I'm done that, please help me thank Brooke for, for